You just got some nice headphones, but you share this somewhere and the first thing people ask is, what gear are you running it on? So let's talk about what these weird boxes people are plugging their headphones into are, and why you need them. What is a DAC? Well, it's one of these. Yeah, but what does it do? A digital to analog converter, a DAC, a DAC. The name sounds like it explains the purpose right away, but what the hell is the difference really between an analog and a digital signal, and why does that even matter? This is a transducer, or driver. These are the things that wiggle back and forth to vibrate the air and produce sound. You'll see them in speakers or in your headphones, and they're really dumb. You see, a digital signal is ones and zeros, which when conducted along a wire actually looks something like this. High voltage representing a one and low voltage representing a zero. Feed this into a speaker or headphone and you get nothing, because the driver is smooth-brained. A driver is, at its simplest, a coil of wire attached to a membrane that moves and a magnet. Pass a positive voltage through the coil and it generates an electromagnetic field that repels it from the magnet. Pass a negative voltage through the coil and it generates an electromagnetic field that pulls it toward the magnet, thereby moving it, and if you move it back and forth fast, you make sound. But because drivers are so dumb, digital information doesn't work. A speaker can't decode or understand what the ones and zeros are trying to say. You need to treat it like it's dumb, and tell it in plain English, or voltage in this case, what you want it to do. And that means we need an analog signal. An analog signal is a voltage that continuously varies over time, not ones and zeros. The higher the voltage, the more it'll cause the driver to move. And to explain how we get a DAC to convert digital to analog, it's best to show how we get to digital in the first place. How we go from recording the sound of your awesome podcast that definitely more than four people will watch, into a digital file. This is a microphone. It's basically a speaker in reverse. Make a sound and this vibrates the membrane. When the membrane vibrates, it produces a voltage corresponding to how much the membrane has been moved back or forth. It's directly converting the sound pressure level into an analog voltage. And this analog signal could be fed to a speaker or headphone to make that driver wiggle in the same way that the microphone membrane was wiggled and therefore reproduce the same sound. But we need to store the signal digitally so we can copy or share it. But computers can't understand analog, they're digital. They think in ones and zeros, and they can't store information about where this signal is at every possible point in time because that'd take infinite storage space. So we just check every now and then. This analog signal is fed into an analog to digital converter, and this ADC measures the signal voltage repeatedly at fixed intervals. The number of times per second you do this is called the sample rate, and most music is 44.1 kilohertz, meaning the ADC is recording the current voltage 44,100 times per second, and each of these individual figures can be stored as a binary value. Most music uses a bit depth of 16, meaning each of these samples has a 16-bit figure. A 16-bit integer can represent anything from 0 to 65,535, meaning we have 65,535 values plus 0 that we can represent the voltage with. So now we can say that at this point in time, the signal was 72.32% of the maximum value, or 47,395 out of 65,535, which in binary is this. So we do this repeatedly, and this gives us a series of values, rather than a continuous analog signal. And we can copy, share, store, and do anything we like with these binary values. But then, how do we convert this digital sampled data back to analog? Well, that's where the DAC comes in. The first thing a DAC will do is take this 44.1 kHz time series of samples and play a mathematical game of connect the dots, figuring out where the bits in between should be and adding new samples. This is called oversampling. The math behind this is pretty complex and beyond the scope of this video, but all you need to know is it works. And by doing this, we can accurately reconstruct the original signal's content up to half the sampling rate that it was recorded at. But now we do need to convert this series of digital samples to an analog output, so how do we do that? The simplest way is an R2R ladder. This is a special circuit with one rung of a resistor, and a resistor of twice its value for each bit in the sample. Each rung can be switched on or off, and the output is half of the one above it. If we bring back that sample of 72.32%, or 47,395 from earlier, in binary it's written like this. So we plonk this into the ladder, connect each rung where the bit is 1, and disconnect each rung where the bit is 0, and it totals up to 72.32%. As long as we have an R2R ladder with 16 rungs, we can convert any 16-bit sample. We then just hold at this value for a short period of time until the next sample comes in, at which point the ladder changes according to the bits in that new sample, repeat until you have an output that looks like this. The last thing we want to do is get rid of these remaining jaggy bits. These weren't there in the thing we originally recorded and are caused by unintended high-frequency products. So we put a low-pass filter or capacitor, which filters out the unwanted high-frequency components, and boom! we've now converted the ones and zeros back to the original analog signal. Most modern DACs actually use a slightly different method to this though, as making an accurate R2R DAC in the real world is quite hard. So they use something called Delta Sigma. 
The basics of this is that rather than having an actual circuit that can output all of the different potential voltages you need, you have one that can only output a few, possibly even being just one bit, meaning you can only ever be on at 100% or off at 0%. But you make it switch on and off really, really fast and average out the result. Think of this as the Flappy Bird method. Rather than dragging your finger to tell the signal exactly where you want it to be at any given time like an R2R DAC, you tap and pulse the full 100% go up instruction and modulate how frequently you tap to control the actual height of the bird. To get 72.32% of your max voltage output of an R2R ladder, you do what we just described above. To get 72.32% out of a 1-bit Delta Sigma converter, you switch from full 100% output to 0% output millions and millions of times, with it being at 100% for about 72.32% of the time and 0% for the rest. When you take this series of extremely high frequency pulses and once again apply a low pass filter to remove all of the high frequency switching noise, what you're left with is the intended analog signal itself. Just like in Flappy Bird, if you want to get to a gap that's about halfway up the screen, you tap the screen about half of the time and lift your finger off for the other half of the time. And the low pass filter effect here is just the fact that the bird doesn't move up instantaneously. So now we know how a DAC works. Cool. But why do you need one? Can't you just plug your headphones into your laptop or PC and call it a day? Well, you can. If you have a headphone output on your PC, there is a DAC inside. Something is converting digital to analog to output to your headphones. But DACs are not all built equal. It might sound like they're just doing a mathematical task, but there are many factors that will affect how accurate they are. An R2R DAC will not have perfect resistor values, meaning samples converted won't have exactly the correct value, and this creates distortion. And if a DAC of any type converts samples with absolute perfect accuracy, but does so with slightly inconsistent timing, this also creates distortion known as jitter. And even if a DAC was perfect, a PC is a very noisy device. There's a lot of things inside producing electromagnetic interference that can get picked up and carried through to the output of the DAC or interfere with other operation of the DAC. It's like asking an artist to draw a picture whilst outside in a hurricane. They're a good artist, their mother is very proud, but you're not making it easy for them to do a good job. When I measured the headphone output of my laptop, the harmonic distortion and noise was about minus 80 dB, which means it's not even accurate to 16 bits. But when I measured the level of distortion and noise on this Eversolo DAC Z8, it was beyond minus 120 dB. It is orders of magnitude more accurate. So do you need a DAC? Yes. Without one, you are not getting any music at all. Headphones and speakers can't play digital information and it must be converted to analog first. But do you need a DAC besides the one that you've got already? No, but it might be a good idea. For not much money, you can get something like a Fio KA11, which is objectively pretty great, and this will almost certainly do a better job than the one that was already in your machine. Whether you need to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to buy a DAC which uses really complicated and expensive ways of getting small improvements in accuracy depends on how insane you are. But whilst I say that I myself am a proponent for using a good quality DAC, the money is going to be best spent on things that will make a bigger difference first, like your headphones. And K but now we've got another problem. You've bought a DAC and there's no headphone output. How do you connect your headphones or speakers? A DAC's job is to provide an analog signal, the analog instructions if you will, but not necessarily a signal that will have sufficient power to actually move the driver in your headphones or speakers. For this you need more energy, more energy. And that's where amplifiers come in. Want to learn about that? Well, get subscribed to be notified when part two of this series comes out. And if you want to help support content like this being made, or if you need a DAC for yourself, head over to headphones.com and have a look at the variety of options available, all of which come with headphones.com's 365 day return policy. In the meantime, if you've got any questions or wanted to learn more about audio, music, or gear, then head over to the headphones.com Discord server or the headphones.com forum and I and other Wiggly Air enthusiasts will endeavor to help. Until next time, thanks for watching.